Okay, the recording's live. I'm going to make sure everyone can share their screen. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, Lou, good morning. Morning. Uh, the, the, as I said earlier, I think the, uh, the conversation uh, that we wanted to have with you this morning was uh, we're looking, trying to be as physically responsible as possible, right? We're talking to a number of um, different departments who have large budgets. Um, and I think yours is one of the largest, if not the largest in the county to see what we're doing during this time when uh, expenses are probably significantly less than they have been uh, while income remains relatively stable and to see what, if anything, we can do to uh, ease the burden of the taxpayer. So that's really the uh, genesis for the, for the conversation. We will be having it with other departments as well. Uh, I did ask uh, Nikki to send, I think that the total millage that uh, the op center is getting now is 18 and a half mils. Is that right? Yeah, 8.7. Okay. And um, um, so I guess the questions that we have is how is the income and expenses gone? Uh, how much do we have in reserve? And um, uh, what, what, if anything, can we do to uh, tighten our belts and, uh, uh, as we move forward. So with that, I'll leave it up to Richard or to Lou to talk. So Richard, do you want to give an overview of where we're at? And then I'll just kind of jump in and uh, talk about, you know, some of the things that we've been doing and what are our, our projections and those kind of things. But yeah, let me, um, let me see if I can pull up um, a, a projection that we have to, um, complete for the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. It's a, it's a pretty um, comprehensive document. So bear with me here. I am not a Zoom guru by any sense of the imagination, but uh, let me see if I can pull this up. And oh, let's see here. Yeah, this would be the, this would be the one. I don't know if everyone can, can, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. This is like I say, this is a, a form that, that the, uh, is, is a statutory requirement um, that we complete for the Department of Developmental Disabilities. And what this does, it, it, it shows the revenue sections over here, local revenue. Um, well, actually, let me start at the top. I guess that'd be the easiest. This is our tax levies. And, and the amount of money that it generates. Then the next section talks about local revenue, state revenue from DODD, from ODE and others, federal, and then any kind of miscellaneous. Then what they do is they take and just lump expenditures down into personal expenses, personnel expenses, and pretty much other in, in this case, which is, you know, all your operation, your contract services, your utilities, and those kinds of things. Um, it also shows our demographics. In other words, the number of full-time employees that we have, 122. Then um, it also shows the number of people that we have on Medicaid waivers. Uh, I'm not sure how versed uh, everyone is on that, but that is a a uh, federal funding stream that helps uh, pay for services. And then the other section here is non-waiver folks, people that are not uh, either on a waiver or not eligible for waivers, or it also includes the uh, number of uh, school kids that we have um, and infants as well. As you know, as you know, we serve pretty much from birth to, to death. And um, so that kind of shows, you know, like the number of people that we serve um, and, and those kind of things. And then down here at the bottom, it actually shows the cash balance for the year and then what the variance is and what they mean by that is uh, revenue versus expenditures. And then they, they show this line here is if you were to, um, you know, to recover what type of millage you would have to run to get your, your, uh, 
variance if it's in a, in a negative. In other words, like here, if we wanted to, you know, cover this, we would need a 0.44 mil levy. Uh, it just, it just it comes, it comes really into play and later on when you get down into like 2029, you know, you'd have to run 7.9 mils to cover that deficit. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a very good tool, I think, to, um, to show, uh, you know, at a glance where we're at. Um, it, it um, the department needs this information because of the concerns that if some counties are in a negative, uh, a very, you know, negative financial uh, situation, there are uh, statewide implications. And they, they put this into the uh, Ohio Revised Code, so they would be able to know where every county board stands, uh, you know, financially. So I don't know if this is helpful or or whatnot, um, but it's just sort of a thumbnail type of uh, recap of where we're at and those kind of things. Yeah, I, I, Richard, this is Mike. You know, yeah, Mike. I think that it is helpful, but. What, what you got there is the assumption that um, the school would be in full operation over right. the next time, and they are projections. And, you know, we, we, we kiddingly say that uh, this is my first rodeo, but this is our first rodeo as it, can, as it talks about the COVID situation and basically operations being shut down. So what I'm interesting, interested to know um, is uh, you guys have pretty much been – on hiatus since uh, March, is that right? Not, not really. We've been we have been not open to the public, but our staff have been going out to the homes. We are required by state and federal law to continue the services. So the school did continue through uh, Zoom meetings, dropping off uh, educational packages to the kids in the school, and then monitoring and a lot of video conferencing with with folks, and then in the adult world. A lot of our staff were um, sent out to help provider homes. So we're responsible for residential services as well, as we talked about at the meeting. And the residential providers, because of COVID, have struggled with staffing. And we have to ensure the health and safety of individuals. So our staff has been, we, we deployed our staff out into those homes um, in order to stabilize and make sure that everybody was safe. We've been delivering over this crisis period food out to homes to make sure that our individuals have food um, and, the, and the essentials. So we, it's a different model of delivery rather than people coming to us, we're going to them, which is really what the future model that the state continues to push is, is people more with more individualized services. And I've continually pushed back that long term, I don't know if we could afford that because of the cost is greater instead of bringing people in, there's a cost efficiency in congregate care. But the state's directive and the federal government's directive has been pushing for more individualized supports. And so we're trying to figure out how to balance those two at this time. So a couple of things we've done since this is the board, because understanding the financial hardship has um, not uh, granted any type of increase. If they minimize our staffing as much as possible, but making sure that people's needs are met, that has that it's caused us to, re to reassign all of our staff in different, different job duties under their job description as other duties as assigned. I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of an overview of some of the things <laughs> we've been doing. So, Lou, this is, uh, this is Tony. So, Mike, I think if I'm if I'm understanding your question. You're, you're kind of asking if the, your expenses during this period from March to today um, have gone down, Lou. And I think if I just heard you, your expenses have not gone down. Is that an accurate statement? Um, some have gone that? down. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, if I can answer that. Uh, we've had, we've had um, you know, obviously savings in, in fuel. You know, I mean, you know, um, you know, our buses are not on the roll road, so we've we've saved a lot of money there. Obviously. Um, however, what we don't know is as we move forward to, you know, hopefully reopening 
in some format, one way or the other. Uh, you know, if you look at some of the, what they call that reset and restart from the governor's office and whatnot, um, we're not sure of what kind of, you know, PPE, hand sanitizers in every room and all these other things. So while we have recognized some savings in this past, uh, you know, four months now, unbelievably, uh, we have we have some expenses coming that we really don't know what those are going to be. You know, I mean, to get people back here um, for services once we open the schools and whatnot, you know, we're, we're not sure what the transportation guidelines are going to be. You know, we may end up having to put more buses back on the road to have, uh, you know, to keep the social distancing and, and those kinds of things. Uh, what kind of uh, expenditures we're going to have to uh, do the extra cleaning that's going to be required. Um, you know, the buses are going to have to be sanitized inside and out every day, uh, probably morning, morning round, afternoon round. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen some um, temporary, or not tentative, I guess, guidelines on, you know, how the rooms uh, are going to have to be sanitized several times a day and things like that. And, you know, those kind of costs are, are uh, you know, expense, everything's expensive. Uh, you know, even just the math that used to be eight cents a piece for, you know, going on sale for $1.40 a piece. Those kind of well, Richard, this is Mike again. I, I am, as you are, a numbers guy, right? Mm -hmm. first, exactly. thing that I, first thing that I would say is there's probably, uh, you know, when you do have to put in these new procedures, there's probably some reimbursement uh, reimbursement ways to get uh, the, the COVID expense back to you. Any expense. Okay, so that is certainly an issue, but that income would be above and beyond your typical income because you would uh, get a grant or some type of funding to take care of COVID. Uh, going back to the numbers thing, you know, what, what I'm interested in, I know we're talking about some money and saving some money and still having some expenses, but uh, the question I have, for example, is through June 30th, what are your total expenses compared to what they were 2019 through June 30th? And we can get you that. I don't know, Dick, if you have access to that right now, if you could get that, but we could get that for you. But the one thing that I do think I need to, to let you know, and let me show you a, a sheet because it, it really reflects um, kind of where we are in relationship to other counties in terms of our costs for day services. And Mike, while Lou's doing that, I, I can certainly get you that information. Um, I would like to, you know, run the numbers and look at it so I can analyze, you know, what the differences are. So if you look at the sheet that I put in front of you, this is from our COG financial report that we got yesterday. And this shows all the counties around us. And so IO waiver is a funding source for residents. All three of these are funding sources. Lou, you're Lou, really I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, oh, can you Lou. hear me now? Wait, let's see. Yeah, a little can you repeat that, please? Sure, one second. I have a better mic. I had. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I put in front of you is, this is a sheet that came from our COG, which is a council of government that uh, helps oversee and provide supports to our residential providers. But these are our average costs for number of individuals per waiver service that we serve. And if you look at the first item, which is the IO waiver, that is the higher cost waiver. Um, our average cost is 42,000. Ottawa is 91. You know, Marion is 72. We are the, the lowest in, in that for the number of people we serve. Um, the level one waiver as well, we are in the lower, lower um, area for that as well. And then the self waiver. These are all funding sources. So my, my point with that is, is that when you're really financially frugal, like we typically are, budget cuts hit us worse. 
And so one of the things that we're facing right now, Mike, you talked about the savings, is the State Department of DD, is, in order for their cut, they have, a, they have really passed their cut on to us and we've not gotten the final confirmation, but it is expected that it will be confirmed here shortly that they're expecting us to pay for a provider rate increase for our provider staff out of those reserves that, uh, that we've built for not necessarily billing those services. In addition to that, as part of the COVID correction plan, um, they're allowing day services, which is the workshop services, to start to amp up again, but they're requiring us to do that at a ratio instead of right now an average ratio of 1 to 12 or 1 to 15 at 1 to 9 and at increased staffing and increased safeguards in, in terms of making sure that the building is clean three or four times a day, which is more a higher scrutiny than we currently have, but I mean, it makes sense. But again, they're passing that cost on to us. So where you may see some savings in our budget, the state has already allocated that out and is expecting us to pay, to pay those costs, if that makes any sense. Okay, then, and then I go back to one of my original questions or thoughts, is there, an application process uh, through the CARES Act or through any other act that you would be reimbursed for the cost of uh, COVID related expenses? I think there may be some through what I'm hearing from other county board superintendents that they, there is some reimbursement for the PPE equipment through the county commissioner's fund through the CARES Act. Some county uh, commissioners have met with the their superintendents are allowing them to share those costs and get reimbursed through the CARES Act. Now, we're trying not to do that because we know your guys' budget was, is hit hard as well. But on the same token, we, uh, Stacy, uh, I'll let you chime in here. Uh, the Opportunity Center would be part of um, the disbursement for the um, CARES Act money if they had expenses. Uh, yeah, we had asked uh, Julie about that, and I think that kind of falls under the same aspect that we could allow um, health department, school of op, um, get some reimbursements. So. Okay. And it looks like there will be money available to do that, right? Uh, we're, we've got quite a bit of expenses, especially in the salary line, so um, right. we might be over our allocation. Okay. And, and I guess that was kind of that was kind of our thought that you know we're we're not facing you know the reduction in sales tax and, and things like that, that that you guys are, and you know so we were thinking maybe we could we could weather the storm locally here so you guys can uh, you know take full advantage of the, uh, the the CARES Act money that you get. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Kirshner, something that we need to watch is uh, there is that the rest of that pool of money that's still in Columbus. Uh, right. you know, the words I've heard are that some of that's going to be ma made available for schools. So that that's something to keep an eye on. And current uh, in, in the federal government, what's been released has been the uh, they're looking at a bigger package to do as well so more ways for, for schools yeah i appreciate you bringing that up because i do know there is a significant pool of money yet to come above and beyond what we've got to disperse at this point that's why i was referring to that when it came to reimbursement for mm -hmm. covid related expenses for the school okay i mean we're very eager to do what we can do to help out every everybody in the community uh, the hard part for us is a lot of our services are dictated by federal law and because we've participated in federal programs to pull down federal match. So, so unfortunately, those strings tie into a lot of our service delivery. So we can't necessarily cut or reduce services to people. It is the concern that, that I've had for a while with the growth of Medicaid. We've tried to manage it as much as we can, but if there are federal cuts or federal increases in expectations for services, we are obligated to those purse strings. 
and it's, it's really established by the state. So for example, the provider rate increase was agreed to and passed by the General Assembly and they, because of the budget cuts, have passed it on to us and there's, not, there's nothing I could do about it. It's just we're basically going to have to pay the rate increase. And my point is, is our providers, because we meet with them regularly, are doing okay financially right now. They're not, I mean, anybody, any private provider or private business is going to take more money if you give it to them, but they're not begging for money. But the problem is in large metropolitan areas, those providers are, and it's a statewide system, so the state is treating us like everybody else, which is driving our costs up if that makes sense. Okay. And the final, point that, yeah, the final point that I had on my mind uh, was that um, the reserves, uh, we, the county, as you know, manages the investment portfolio. And in lieu of any type of rental income from the school, the county owns the building. Uh, we have uh, taken the interest on, that, uh, on those investments to income for general operating money. Uh, we also do um, an assessment as to co uh, cost allocation when it comes to buildings. Stacy, I'm gonna call on you again. I don't know the last time that cost allocation was done and how that would compare to the interest that we receive off of the uh, investment portfolio, especially with rates being as low as they are. Uh, we do cost allocation every year. I would have to pull that up and see what it is. Okay. And at most of that's on a per square foot basis. Say that again. Most of that is on a per square foot basis. Um, it's it's different uh, formulas based yeah. on the work that the county has has to do for each building, utilities, the um, different aspects. Yeah, I know, and I know the op Yeah, the op center has been very generous in that. Uh, they are paying for their utilities and their building maintenance, I believe. Is that right? Right. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Hey, Stacy, okay. can you go on that, um, the, the cost allocation thing? Isn't it also uh, based on some of the services provided by the auditor and the treasurer and the prosecutor and those, those yeah. kind of things as well? Yeah. yeah. And just for a historical background, and this goes back many, many years, um, the, I think the thought, and Mike, I think you're, you're thinking on the light term, is that, you know, the interest income that our money generates offsets, you know, those, those costs, I think, is, is where we were many years ago. But it's been a long time since it's been revisited. Yeah, that's, you know, what? we lost you a little bit, Mike. Oh, it was somewhere south of one and a half percent. Um, uh, so based on that interest rate environment, I think we need to take another look. Sure. I don't know, gentlemen, any, any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Paradiso or comment? Yeah, I just had, I do have one question. Uh, I have a comment for... Uh, uh, nice job, Lou, on uh, Richard being frugal and putting your costs down uh, per uh, consumer. That That's pretty impressive. Uh, my question is, uh, Richard, when you had the financials up, I think it was column B, uh, 2020 projections were a negative, it was a big number, what was it, six, eight hundred thousand? Uh, let's see here. That can get that back up. Given the start that we've had, we've just you know vetted that out. Uh, I would assume you did not project that kind of deficit when you did the budget. Well, the the interesting thing. Um, oh, yeah, I just like to understand. That. <clears throat> I'm trying to find that report again. Or is that more of a cash flow? Well, it's it's a, it's sort of a cash flow thing. But one of the things that um, that the the way our budgeting process works, you know, the fact that we are, um, you know, our levy revenue is 
constant, except for any kind of new construction or whatever. There are, there are going to be peaks and valleys of, of our um, operations. Matter of fact, I think if you look, if you look over on this page here, this kind of shows how the, the projections are revenue to uh, expenses and then cash balance. You know, if we did nothing, which obviously we can't have a $40 million deficit in 10 years, but you know, this just shows if current trends continue, this is where we would be. You know, obviously we, we can't do that. Um, so, but there will be a time, Tony, where, where our expenses will be more than revenue just because of the, the, levy, the levy cycle as you know, you'll, you get more money on the front end, and then as time goes by, it um, you'll get into that deficit spending. Um, it's just kind of the nature of the beast because we really get no, uh, you know, no new money. It's not like uh, you know your your inside millage will go up uh, based on valuations where ours stay um, stable. You know, in other words, uh, like and that, let me show you this real quick as, as it relates to our as it relates to our levy. Um, if I can get this over here now, yeah, I apologize. I'm not the not a Zoom guru. Can you see this picture here? This spreadsheet which talks of our levies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As you can see, there's the 8.7 that we talked about earlier, but currently, I'm not seeing that sheet, Richard. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think, think it's column. Yeah, column B through J shows the levies, or is there a different one? Uh, I'm sorry. I guess it's. I, I guess um, I don't have the right one up here. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, this, this does talk about the levies, but it must not be what you're. No, I'm sorry. I'm not sure how to get it up there. The, the the one you had last time under revenue kind of laid it out. I if you think. stop, if you stop sharing and then reshare, maybe Richard. Uh, okay, possibly. <laughs> uh, let's see if I... commenting on that. Now, do you have do you have this one here? It's just uh, about half a sheet. Yeah. Okay. See what what this what this shows is our 8.7 mills. You know, total mills. These are the total levies passed. You know, starting in 1980 and continuing. But the levy itself is actually reduced down to 5.57 for what they call Class One properties, and 7.97 for Class Two. Class One is your residential and your agriculture, and Class Two are your commercial and industrial and those kind of things. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I was talking about, how we get to, you know, we, we have to get more money at the beginning of the levy cycle because they're, you know, they're reduced every, every, pretty much every year, uh, based on increase in valuation and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's, otherwise we run, have to run a levy almost every year, you know, uh, to, to, to operate on. And as you can see, we've been able to stretch our levy levies out. Uh, the last one we ran was in 2015, uh, 14 years uh, after the last one prior to that. So I don't know, Tony, if that answers your question or not. A little bit. So back to the deficit for 2020. Mm -hmm. Is that just uh, so that this, this is just a year where that occurs, right? Right, and it, it will continue. It'll it'll continue every year. See that. And, and and so in our levy cycle, what we traditionally try to do is we run a levy, and then we the first several years of the levy we yield more, building up a reserve, and then we slowly eat through that reserve until that reserve is depleted into our, our overall budget. And then in that point, we try to look for a levy a year ahead of that, trying to push them out at least ten or so years. The one thing with the uh, 8.7 millage, where it is high and probably one of the higher ones in the state, the actual yield of that millage because of this community has always been supportive of the Opportunity Center. And we were, have, we've had levies that were on the books early on. The actual 
yield of that millage is, is substantially different than other counties. So we may be high in the total number of mills, but the actual yield because of the older levies is probably on the average side. And we can get that data for you to show you where we are comparatively. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, for me, uh, fairly new, this, this is the math I'm trying to understand. Yeah, uh, Blue, you, you talked about uh, uh, having more money in the beginning and then eating through the reserves and uh, then having to go back. And I understand that. But where are you at in that cycle now? Where are we at with reserves for the Opportunity Center as we sit here? Today? Let me, let me, um, Let me, let me try to pull that back up. Okay, this, this is where, where we're at as, right? Um, these are our beginning cash balances. So as you can see, starting in, in this year, which, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think that Negative is going to be um, reality once we, you know, get through everything for this year. But then, as you can see, we start eating into the reserves um, until we end up with a, a projected deficit in 2026. Okay, so what, what, where are we at with reserves at this point? What's the number? Okay, right now, I was our reserve at. at um, 1231 was 10 million. Grand 19 was 10 million, Mike. Okay. And what are the annual operating costs for, on average, the annual operating costs for the Opportunity Center? Okay, here's here's our expenses. Well, he, I don't think he can see that, Richard, since he's- Oh, oh I'm sorry, okay. That might, um, that's a handicap to you, Mike. We can send you these sheets so you can see them if you want to. I think that would help. Yeah, right now the the uh, the actual expenses in um, 2019 were 10 million 651. So uh, my my point is, you basically have one year's worth of operating expenses in reserve. That's a that's pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I got a couple of things. If right now we're at that tipping point. We're actually on the downside now of our left side. Okay. Yeah, just a couple of things. One, from a risk standpoint, I think uh, obviously the state funding is going to be uh, a challenge for the next several years. Uh, listening to DeWine, you know, the biggest part of their budget is uh, Medicaid, Medicare kind of expenditures and you know, everything's going to have to be cut. So I think there's some risk built into the system there that we're gonna to have to monitor. Uh, the other thing, and this maybe for Tony is any, anything, um, you know, probably been a year ago now, Lou, that, you know, a case kind of dropped into Seneca County and uh, it was gonna potentially fall on the School of Opportunity. And I forget the numbers, the numbers were big, it was, Five hundred dollars a day or something to care for this individual, right? And and it got worked out, but you know the point from a risk management standpoint is, uh, you know there are things in the community that, uh, you know could drive some expenses that uh, are unforeseen at this point, uh, and you know if Lou, if you want to talk to that, uh, sure. you know sure. I know in Sandusky County. Uh, they, they had the same conversation, but what they found when they did their analysis was that there was uh, a number of aging caregivers in the community that were taking care of their own children uh, or adopted children in some cases. And when they were no longer available uh, because of their age, then it was going to fall to the school of opportunity. And that was kind of a unfunded uh, mandate that existed in the community. So, 
if you want to talk to either one of those, although just so I can understand. Sure, sure. On to your point, we do. We have a large number of aging caregivers in our community. Our parents are getting older. Their adult children are living with them. They have saved the county a lot of money over the years because we, you know, the dichotomy of our world today is we have younger families who have children who are 18 with disabilities who are arguing and saying, they're your responsibility now, you need to provide residential supports. We, we've, so we've, we've kind of balanced that pressure, but we also have on the flip side, a number of aging caregivers who have saved us money, who are now aging. So right now I know of at least three aging caregivers. Um, one has been a community leader, supported our program incredibly over the years, is coming down with uh, dementia and no longer able to care for his son. And so we're trying to figure out an alternative placement for his son. And those placements, depending on the, the, the need of that son, could be anywhere from $60,000 a year to up to $500,000 a year, depending if it happens to be um, expl an explosive person. Like the child you mentioned before was a child that had a lot of behavior to the point where the developmental center even struggled with keeping her. Um, she has been sexfully, successfully placed in out of county funded by the state, which has saved uh, right at this point, probably close to three quarters of a million dollars in, in residential services because the state has covered that cost. But typically the state is not covering those costs for, for our aging caregivers. They're expecting us to cover it and us to have a reserve to cover that. Um, and so we do anticipate in, in our budget is money for those residential emergencies. And it's a hard one because, you know, sometimes they come and sometimes they don't. And a lot of times when they come, they come in large numbers. So last year, if you look at the savings, we anticipated some that we didn't get, but we are expecting those to come to fruition this year. The concern that I have with COVID impacting seniors harder than younger folks is that those aging caregivers have impacted those children, adult children, are going to become our responsibility to serve residentially if, if anything happens to parents, if, if we do have a large outbreak. So we're trying to, to, in our budget as much as we can, we have those risk, risk factors involved. Does that help? Yeah, that's, that's what I was looking for. Thanks, Lou. Thanks. Um, the other thing, and, and Commissioner Paradiso hasn't probably seen this cycle either, um, periodically, uh, as needed, the Budget Commission has call, called in the School of Opportunity and asked them to justify their levies. So when the carryover gets to a certain point, there is a conversation at the Budget Commission. And from a legal standpoint, it's my understanding that they can actually, you know, declare that um, that levy shouldn't be collected in full any longer. So that, that is a uh, safeguard for the taxpayers uh, at the Budget Commission. And I know I've sat through at least one of those uh, presentations and it went very similar to this. So I just know, Tony, that there is another safeguard out there if the School of Opportunity, you know, was running amok with taxpayer money that the, the Budget Commission does have uh, some authority over that. Thanks. And, and Tony, if you ever want to stop out, I can give you the, the, the big financial picture <laughs> and really blow your mind. Okay, might take you up on that. P please do. I would, I would love to explain our, our, uh, our system is, is, is unique. And Mike, you, you as well, because I know you're a numbers guy and I, I, it's hard because I know you're driving to look at some of this, but we want to get you the information and explain where we are so you're informed. And you, Shane, Shane, you're as welcome as well. Whatever we could do to give you the information. Because I think that, you know, we have tried really hard to be frugal with our dollars. Um, and, you know, I've fought vigorously at the state because they're trying to increase costs. Our consumers are happy with the services at the level that they are now. Um, and I would tune it to, you know, uh, a Chevy versus a Cadillac. People are happy with a Chevy, but if you give them a ride in a Cadillac and uh, then expect them to move back to a Chevy, it may be a little resentment. And, I, and my concern with where the state is going with more individualized services, where I support it, and I can't argue that it's not better for people, 
it's what can we afford and what can we maintain long run? Because I feel our system is going to crash because if you look at the average costs outside of our county in terms of how they continue to grow or residential services, some counties are exceeding an average of $120,000, $130,000 per person on an annual basis when the median income of their communities are 47000 where if you look at our sheet, ours is, is, is pretty average for what our community is. You know, and so I do worry that the state is continually trying to spend our money and increase the cost. And so I may need your help at some point to push back politically to say, you know, if people are happy with the services they're, they're, they're receiving now, their health and safety needs are being met, why are we increasing costs in an economic downturn? Yeah, there, I mean, there is no question that, uh, and I think I speak for the board, that we appreciate everything that the uh, Opportunity Center does. And this isn't, a, this isn't any sense of a deba debate about how well you provide services, because I think you guys do uh, a yeoman's job there, and I, I personally appreciate it. Um, but, you know, we're having a fiscal conversation. I, you know, unfortunately, we, in this environment, we need to have that conversation to make certain that we're being as responsible as we can in all areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for the kind words. Yeah. And, and like you said, we're willing to share whatever we can and show and justify our costs. You know, the hard part is, is that it, like I said, it's the partnership with the state and federal government is driving costs up. And I think the hard part with that, and you guys know from the political standpoint, is the larger counties who have more resources traditionally rule the roost. We get we get some input, but not the input that they traditionally have. And and you know, you look at some of the larger boards when a one mil levy generates thirty two to thirty five million dollars. Yeah, they they're serving more people, but they still have more available to serve people than we do. We have tried really hard keep our costs down and the hard part about that is now we're in an economic downturn they have wiggle room we don't but we will do whatever you guys suggest or recommend if you have any ideas to help us improve we're open to those suggestions okay uh ladies and gentlemen any other questions we appreciate the time that everybody's Thank you. morning Stacy, I appreciate you getting up at 8.30 and uh, being there. Uh, I, uh, I guess what we'll do is go into adjournment unless there's anything else and reconvene at 10 o'clock. Okay. See you then. Thanks, Thanks Stacey. Thank you all very much.